tag the bus, all right? The bus has been, you can't help but know that that's a, that's a Bible church on that bus. It's on either side or on the back. You can see and so we're driving through Fort Worth, and I've got this bus tagged, and this guy, I'm doing 70, that's the speed limit, doing 70, and some guy emerges in, he's in a big Ford F-150 pretty truck. He pulls the lane next to me, and then he pulls in front of me doing 50. And I'm doing 70 with a bus and a trailer. And he pulls right in front of me. And so I can't help but, you know, get up all new business. And so I'm right up there. <laughs> I'm right on his tail thinking, dude, you just pulled in front of me. And I'm doing 70. So I'm, I don't want to slam on the brakes. I'll have big goals coming down my, my ankles. And so I just right up there going, come on, man, you've got to help me. And then he tapped his brakes because I was like, And so I'm Dude, now you violated like man law. <laughs> I'm trying to graciously, so I, I, I slow down, and then he starts to slow down. One thing, a tapping brakes, I did that. And then he starts to slow down. And so I'm thinking in my head, what well, we just divert the uh, accident knucklehead. Almost had an accident right there. And then, so I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to pass this young fellow. And so I, I go to pass him, I'm thinking, my bus says that there's a Bible church. <laughs> how, how am I going to pass him? So I did. I passed him. They just don't look. Just don't look. I'm driving this way. Just don't, get out that way. just don't look. And I passed him. And, and of course, as I see my rear mirror, he's making certain gestures at me. And, uh, and so it was just kind of those funny moments. When you tag your car, you stand out just a little bit. When you tag your car, you can't drive the same way. It's because you have a little decibel to turn stickers on your car. Now, you can't drive the same way, especially when it's like font 7900 or something. You just can't drive that way. And there's something about anonymity that helps you get away with poor behavior. When you, when no one knows who you are, no one knows that you're a Christian, you can kind of drive however you want, right? Because unless you say something, they're not going to know. So don't put anything on your car that would indicate otherwise. And we kind of laugh at the driving part of it, but there's an aspect of that that's really true when it comes to how we live our lives. If no one knows that I'm a Christian, then I can kind of either act or not act according to how Christ would have been. You see where I'm going? We can kind of maybe not can fudge a little because they don't, they don't know who I am. So anonymity can sometimes breed a, a loss of Christianity in your practice. And what we're going to do for the next couple of weeks the life of our church is, is take a little bit and refresh and then reboot. We're going to refresh some things that we probably have heard many times. And then we're going to reboot. Usually in August, we kind of just slow down a little bit. We've got a big fall coming up. We have uh, the Awana that's starting. We have other things that are going to be taking place. And we're going to need your help in Awana. And so we're kind of slow, we slow down in August as far as events. We've been to Mexico. We've been to camp. We've been to vacation Bible school. We just got back from Six Flags. And so now it's just, let's refresh some things that, that are critical in the life of our church and in your life so that you can have an effective year at the church and continue to grow. So I want to spend some time this morning refreshing some things. There's an insert inside of the board. This week we're going to talk about the gospel. Next week we're going to visit another subject that's very important. That's why we're even here. Today we'll talk about the gospel and what it is. Next week we'll talk about who we are because of the gospel and what we are because of the gospel and what we're supposed to do now. And in the following weeks we'll talk about our church, what you need why, why you need and what we are, why you need to be here and what we are as a church, what we're trying to do individually and as well as believers. And then the final part, uh, we'll talk about different aspects of our church because several years ago of just different entry points to our church. My prayer um, is that our church continues to grow. Am I alone in that? Yeah. Apparently I'm close. Am I alone in that? <laughs> My prayer is our church continues to grow. It's not for numbers. I was telling our staff this morning, I don't like talk about numbers. Can I talk about numbers? No, we come back. I don't know how that works, but all of a sudden, like, if I mentioned numbers, they were just going to go, well, we don't need to go because there's a lot of people there. I don't like talk about numbers. But I pray that we need more blue chairs. There are not any blue chairs in my office because we need them in other places. And my prayer is that we continue to need blue chairs. And so I pray that the chairs say this empty. Empty, you're sitting next to an empty chair, that next week it's full. That there, we just need to buy four of them. But how do people find their way into and through our church? We'll talk about that finally at the end of August. You just go through some things that we've discussed in the years past, but refresh. And then come 
After Labor Day, that's when we reboot. That's when we start kind of doing different things. So Awana kicks in. Is that mentioned in anyone other than Awana? Because I've mentioned it a lot. Uh, we can help at Awana. Uh, we can play sometimes about our community and boy, crime rates high, the way people don't know how to drive. We take driving lessons at Awana. We fix that. But we can do things to help people when they're little, families. And we do that through Awana, and I'm going to need your help. Did you say that three times already? I'm going to need your help. And, uh, there'll be a place for you to sign up to be involved with that. We're preaching boys and girls for the gospel of Christ Jesus. And so today I want to talk to you about the gospel. What is it? We talk about the gospel, and sometimes you'll hear about it, and we'll explain it here in church, but let's, let's kind of dig into it and, and see what we're supposed to do with this. The deepest, most all-encompassing doctrine you can study in the Bible is not the book of Revelation. Just about everybody who starts reading the Bible is like, I want to start reading the book of Revelation. It's a great book. It's a fascinating book. And we've done that before, and you're welcome to do that. But the most all-encompassing doctrine is the gospel. It's salvation. It touches on everything. You won't understand the book of Revelation until you understand the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. You can jump into Revelation. It's a fascinating study. Jump into the Old Testament. That's great. But if you don't see it through the lens of saved by grace through faith, it'll be a mystery to you. What is it? How, we can stand in awe of the gospel for decades and years on end. The reason the subject is neglected is because the more powerful God is, the less powerful you are. The more righteous God is, the more of a sinner you become. You elevate the holiness of God and you realize that you're you not that holy. You need something. And so in our culture today, we like to diminish the holiness of God because it elevates the righteousness of man, of which he has none. It makes us feel better. And so proper understanding of the gospel puts God in the right place. It puts man in the right place. It puts God on the pedestal of being worthy of worship, holy and righteousness. And it puts man in a position of need. And men don't like to need. We like to think that we're good enough. We like to think that what we did yesterday was powerful. We like to think that God would accept us if He just gave us a chance. And the reality is, is we would all fail the test every single time, without exception. I talk to some about sharing the gospel with them, and they say, well, I think I've been good enough. And I say, okay, well, let's play the compare game. Mother Teresa, where are you on that scale? Here, 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 here. here. Where exactly do you fall on that scale? Oh, I'm not even close to Mother Teresa. Oh, okay. Well, how about Billy Graham? Oh, well. Maybe right under Billy Graham. Right, right in there. Okay. How about Jesus Christ? Oh, not even close. So unless your righteousness surpasses that, there's no hope for you. Well, I'll do better tomorrow. Well, let's not talk about tomorrow. Let's talk about yesterday, which you can do nothing about. Well, I wasn't very good yesterday. Well, bummer for you. Ty, you get that out. You're going to have to do something else. You see what I'm saying? And so if you start talking about the righteousness and the holiness of God, it starts to put man in the proper perspective. And that's why this doctrine is oftentimes neglected. People who are pretty good aren't good enough. And so you have to see who God is. I probably don't have to address the need of the life-changing gospel in your life. My guess is that many of you have accepted Christ, and not all of you have accepted Christ as your Savior. You've come to that place in your spiritual life where you know for certain that if you were to die today, or tomorrow, or the next day, by faith you would go to heaven. You've come to that place in your life. You do not need to accept Christ again. You do it one time, praise God, just once. And it's permanent, sealed forever. It's like when you were born. You don't have to be reborn. You were born one time. You have one birthday. You celebrate it 90 times. Right, Arthur? <laughs> and that's what it is. Or Miss Erlene coming up on. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. But you celebrate it just every year. It's the same thing with the gospel. You accept Christ one time, and it's yours. But I've stood in front of crowds before, and including this one, and, and have talked about evangelism, sharing the gospel. And I'm, I'm probably a safe bet. If you could write a check for $200 and never have to share the gospel, never have to bring it up, you probably write the check. People are terrified to actually step out and say something about who Jesus is. To say something publicly. It's like putting on your car, Odessa Bible Church. Because now if you start talking about Jesus, guess what? You have to drive like you know him. That's a little too personal, isn't it? If you want to talk about Jesus at the office, that means you have to behave differently at the office. I would rather write a check. And I did that for a group and made a lot of money that day. 
<laughs> it's a joke. I didn't do that at all. But what happens is, is people are terrified to say anything about the gospel. People are terrified to evangelize. But we are commanded to do so. We are commanded to share the gospel. It's part of our responsibility. Or you get that, Pastor Bob. Let me kind of walk you through a matrix of logic. Jesus commanded his disciples in Luke 24 to go and proclaim the message of God's salvation. It was a command to the disciples. Somebody might say, well, I'm not a disciple, so I don't have to do that. Because I wasn't there. That was written to them. It wasn't written to me. So I don't have to share the gospel. That's somebody else's job. That was the disciples' job. I'm off the hook. But wait just a second. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus commanded his disciples to teach them everything that they had learned and to make them disciples. And so the disciples were commanded to share the gospel. Then they were commanded in Matthew 28, 19 to tell and teach everybody else behind them to do just as they were told and commanded to teach. You see what I'm saying? So the disciples were commanded to share the gospel and then commanded to go tell everybody else how to share the gospel. So you're not quite off the hook. What the disciples were taught, they taught us to do the same thing, Matthew 28. The Spirit equips people in a unique way for the task. Ephesians chapter 4 says that there are people who have the gift of evangelism. Aha! I don't have the gift of evangelism. I have the gift of administration. Off the hook again. Not so. Because we are to follow the Lord's commands. It is all of our responsibilities to share the gospel. Some people are naturally gifted at it. Marco Rivera, our missionary in Acuna, he's just got the gift of evangelism. It just, he can just, it just works for him. He's just naturally gifted at doing it. But we all have the command to share the gospel. Peter called his readers to a purpose of proclamation. 1 Peter chapter 2, 9. And that was part of their purpose, is to proclaim the gospel. To tell others. Peter says that's part of your responsibility. Paul spent his life accomplishing this task. Charging others to imitate him as he imitated Christ. So Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. What did Paul do? He spent his life sharing the good news of Christ Jesus. It is our responsibility, it's throughout the New Testament, that we are to share the gospel. Philippians 3.17 is where Paul says to imitate him. And the primary function of a witness is to... The primary job of a witness is to... Witness. Okay? So go into all the world and, and to make disciples. I'm giving you the power. The Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses. So that's why the Spirit indwells you, is for you to be... A witness the primary function in your life. The disciples did what Jesus said to do. The disciples tell others to do the same thing that they were commanded to do. Therefore, thusly, it is our responsibility to proclaim the message of Jesus to the nations, including the one you currently reside. I wanted to lay out that logic so you come to embrace that evangelism is not an option. It's not. You don't get to say, well, I choose not to do that. You don't have that choice. It is our responsibility to share the good news of Christ Jesus. If you're going to say you want to become more like Jesus, then sharing the message of Jesus is not an option. You must. It must become a part of your life. Is a car a car if it doesn't have any wheels? Yes. But is it a very effective one? No. Okay. Is a fork a fork if it doesn't have any food? Yes. It, it is. But it struggles to find its purpose, does it not? If a shoe is a shoe, a shoe if nobody wears it. There are some shoes in y'all's closets, men, that have not been worn in a long time. Yes, but they're not your shoes. Is it still a shoe? You got it, didn't you? Is it still a shoe? Yes, but once again, it's not fulfilling its full purpose. You can be a Christian and not share the gospel. There's something there that can evolve and grow in you, that you become passionate about, and will help you mature in your relationship with Christ. So, if you are struggling with maturity in Christ, I need to grow in my relationship with Christ. Can I point the finger towards this? I dare you to start considering this. This will make you grow. It'll make you grow in a lot of ways. But you're probably thinking, but wait, 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 let me, I'm a little afraid. I don't, I don't know if I want to do that. Let me give you a couple reasons why people don't like to share the gospel. The first is fear. Anyone? It's okay, be honest. 
it's you're scared. You get a little fear because, well, I'm not really, I'll be singled out. Somebody will look at me differently. They'll think I'm a nut job because I'm talking about Jesus. I'm a little afraid. I'll feel weird. And then what, what if they don't like me? Have you ever graduated from high school? Have you noticed this part of our lives? We're afraid that high school is just this perpetual thing that we carry all the way to the grave. Well, what if they don't like me? Who cares? Look around you. I like you. The person you're sitting next to likes you. It's okay. But we live with this fear. Let me tell you what fear stops. Faith. It'll stop you from experiencing faith. Stepping out in faith. Because it's going to challenge you. You might also think, well, they'll call me a hypocrite. Okay, now think about that logic. Okay. Why? Did you do something that you shouldn't have? Yes, okay. So really all they're doing is asking you to live what you believe. Is that a bad thing? Yes. It's not a bad thing, is it? It's a good thing. They're going to look at you and go, yeah, but you say you love Jesus, but you're one of the meanest persons out here. No one here. <laughs> Somebody else. Isn't that a bad thing? Well, maybe I ought to be nice. You say that you love Jesus and you're a hypocrite. Well... Are you? Are you living the life that you believe? You see what evangelism or sharing the gospel does? It will make you live what you believe. In church, that's a good thing. That's called integrity. You are what you say you are. You are trying to be what you're trying, what you say you believe. And that's a good thing. It actually is going to bring about what the Bible would call sanctification. Holiness in every aspect of your life. When you learn to share the gospel, are willing to share the gospel, it will help you live the gospel. And that's a good thing. You'll look at me, well, I don't really know enough. What if they ask me a question that I don't know the answer to? What is that going to, okay, that, that's fair because they probably will. What is that going to make you do? You have to go look it up. You're going to have to study. <gasps> that's such a bad thing. You're going to have to go Google it. Google everything. You'll find an answer for it. You're going to have to go read your Bible. <gasps> is that a bad thing? That's a good thing. So they're going to say, explain to me the Trinity. You're going to go, uh, I don't know. So you're going to admit humility, that you don't know everything, which none of us would like to admit anyway, right? So you're going to say, well, I really don't know. Let me go look that up. You're going to go look it up. Well, tell me about the hypostatic union. The who? The train <laughs> stop? You're going to go look that up. You're going to study in that say. <laughs> Is that not a good thing? You see where the key to a lot of Christian maturity is in this? You learn to live a consistent life. You're going to live what you believe. And then you're going to study. Because they're going to ask you a question that you're not going to know the answer to. And that's okay. You're going to go long enough to go home and study. I think a big one is, is rejection. What if they say no? What if I'm singled out? No one will be my friend. They'll call me a fanatic. I'll have to eat lunch by myself. No one's going to want to come by my locker. I'm, I'm not going to have any friends. You're in good company. We stay on the shoulders of, of believers worldwide who have no friends except Christ. So that may, might very well be true. And if it is, you're a good company. The church has been built upon people who are willing to say, you can cut me in two and I will not deny Christ. And that wasn't figurative speech. It's literal. You're a good company. Please don't stand behind me. I don't want to be alone. I often think of the cloud of witnesses. Think of what they were willing to sacrifice. And then I've got here going, yeah, well, they might not invite me to roses. There's some guy in heaven who, has, who was disemboweled, thinking, dude, they tore up my intestines. And you are afraid because you won't go to roses. Probably one of the biggest ones is I'll delegate that. That's the pastor's job. Amen? Amen? I'll just let the preacher do it. That's the pastor's job. It's not my gift. I'll let the radio do it. Just, just change all the dials of the word truck to K-Love, Air One, Family Life Radio. It's not my gift. I'll invite them to church. That's a good idea. I'll just do the soft route, soft sell. I'll just invite them to church. Let me ask you, don't do that. Please don't invite them to church until you can ask them about Jesus. And it's easy. It's a very difficult habit to get out of. You'll start going, well, what church do you go to? Do you know what they're going to say? Well, I go to Holy Redeemer Catholic Church. And you go, I'm done. I'm saying, you know what I like to ask? I'll tell you in a minute. 
Can we all agree that these reasons are kind of moot? They don't work. Do they work? They don't work. And if you try to hold on to those reasons, you're going to short circuit your spiritual maturity in Christ. I promise. So I challenge you to, to reconsider. I'll give you an idea in just a little while how you can do it. Because I'll give you the fact that most Christians aren't terrified of this. You're probably nervous already thinking about it, right? Most are. And there's probably good reasons. Number one is you're entering into a world of spiritual warfare that you've just never walked into anymore. People are afraid to share the gospel for lots of reasons. I don't think they should be uh, held on to very tightly. How do we proclaim? How do we do this? So let me start by saying I'm not going to ask you to say anything to anyone this week in regards to the gospel. Okay? So the challenge this morning is not for you to share the gospel this week. In fact, I don't even want you to this week. Do no evangelizing this week at all. Okay? Can we all take a deep breath? That's not the challenge. You do not have to say a word about Jesus this week to anybody. Don't do it. You hear me? Don't do it. Okay? Please don't. Don't do it. Well, this is what I want you to do. I want you to pray first for a divine perspective. I want you to first pray that you will see people as God sees them. Because if it doesn't come from your heart, it's only coming from your hands. You're doing it because, oh, that preacher made me do it. I have to do this. I don't like people anymore. Do you love Jesus? Yes, good enough. Let's go to somewhere else. I don't want you to do it unless you pray, Lord, give me a heart for people. Specific people. People in your sphere. Church, we just sent a man to Uganda. Paid a lot of money to send him to Uganda to help share the gospel by building a water well. You can do it for free tomorrow. You don't have to go anywhere. They're going to pay you to go wherever you go tomorrow. You're going to get paid to go there. Isn't that awesome? And that's your sphere of influence. When Jesus said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, it was concentric circles. Jerusalem was their hometown. I want you to go to your hometown first. You're in your hometown. This is where we start. But I want you to pray first for a heart for people. See people tomorrow. Pray. Lord, help me to see people. Not people who can get me things like my food or my groceries or that heart, or finish that task. But people, like a person, like a, like a you, but over there, a real live person, I want you to pray for a heart for people in a perspective of people that God has. That's the first thing I want you to do. The second thing I want you to do, now I want you to look for opportunities. With those people, I want you to look for an opportunity. Where is there, here's the greatest one of those opportunities I do with your lady used to do this all the time. Somebody would come to her and say, my dog is Oh, my dog is sick. Pray for my dog. And you know what she would do? She'd say, I'll pray for your dog. Let's pray for your dog. And she would use that to build a spiritual connecting point with that person. And she would pray for their dog. You know what she would do three days later? She'd walk up with that person and say, hey, I was praying for your dog. How is your dog? My dog is fine. Oh, your dog, you know what she has built? She has built a spiritual relationship. They now know her name is Betty. They know Betty as a person to go to when they need prayer. And they go to Betty. And Betty would work in the gospel. They would come to Nathan. You pray? Well, let's pray about that. But let me first ask you about your relationship with Jesus. But she had gotten permission because of a previous relationship. She showed that she loved people. And it became a natural outflow of who she was. So I'm going to ask you to love people who are right around you. Get a heart for people. And then I want you to look for opportunities. And that's the easiest one because... Everyone has a problem, and they might talk to you about it at work. And so what do you say? I'll be praying for you. I'll pray. Would you mind if I pray for you? Not, not going to do right now, but I'll be praying for you. Can I pray for you about that? 95% of Americans believe in prayer. So you're safe. No one's going to go, oh, how dare you offer to pray for me? I don't believe in prayer. It's not going to happen in a Caribbean base. In New York City, maybe. But you're not there. Don't pray for anybody on the subway in New York City. Just pray to get off the line. But just pray for people. There are 95% of them out here, if not all of them, believe in it. So offer to pray for them and begin to build that spiritual relationship with them. It's that simple. Look, pray for them, pray for them, or have a heart for people, and then look for opportunities. And then when you're finally there, you're going to have to say something. But Pastor Bob, can, maybe I can just live it out. Well, I'm, I'm just going to live out a good life and they'll catch on. Uh, probably not. Okay, probably not. That's like saying I was going to drive to church and maybe people will just follow me. Probably not. 
Okay? Uh, well, th there are seekers. They'll ask me. Well, without sliding God's ability to draw all men to himself, he normally draws them to a person who isn't afraid to say something. And I'm not really sure if they're seeking anybody. Okay? So there's part of the truth in that, but not a whole lot. Well, I'll just live it. I'll just live it out. Well, that's great, too. And I believe it's an important aspect of declaring who God is. But if you were starving, would you prefer a mind or a speaker to tell you where the food was? Would you want somebody to go? Or would you want somebody to say, hey, you, you look hungry. Let me give you some food. What would you prefer? The truth is both. You want a fat speaker who can talk with their hands. <laughs> somebody say, hey, I've got lots of food. It's over here. It's over here. That's what you want, right? So be that. Live it out and then say something. Live it out and then say something. But you're going to have to say something at some point. You're going to have to say something. And when I was uh, working at Need Him, which was an evangelism ministry, it was so interesting to watch. We would have volunteers come in all the time. They were at different levels of their ability to share the gospel. And uh, Teresa was hurting. She came in. Uh, she was taking phone calls. And I just got off the phone call. And with all humility, that was the best gospel presentation I had. I nailed it, okay? It was witty, it was scripturally based, it was, it was accurate, and man, I, I walked right through the steps of the gospel, and it went just perfect, and the guy did not want to receive Christ Jesus at all. I hung up the phone, or he hung up the phone again, like, what went wrong there? Now, Billy Graham couldn't have done any better than that. That was, Dwight Moody would have been proud of that. There was, that was that was great. And he didn't accept Jesus at all. What happened to that? And then Teresa is on the corner over there, and she's talking to somebody on the phone. And she is all over the map. Okay? She is just in all these different places. She starts with the resurrection. She ends with the cross. She, I mean, she is just everywhere. She's just, and you know what happened? Her guy accepted Christ as his Savior. And I sat there and went, how does that happen? How does that work? The Spirit of God opens it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Just say something. You gotta say certain things, but you just have to do something. You gotta go out and a perfect presentation or one that's just all over the place. Just say something. You're gonna to have to say something at some point. Let me give you three things. If you're gonna present the gospel, you need to talk about three things. You can handle three things if you're writing things down. This is one of those. You need to talk about sin. You need to talk about substitution. And you need to talk about grace through faith in Christ Jesus. Those three things. I can make that last for hours. I can also say it in less than 60 seconds. You've got to talk about sin. You've got to talk about substitution that Jesus died in your place. And you've got to talk about how to receive it. And that is by grace through faith in Christ and in Christ alone. Three things. If you're going to share the gospel, you've got to say it. Though you've got to include those three things. I've included inside of your bulletin this morning a gospel presentation. This is not a script. If you can memorize those three things, sin, substitution, and by grace through faith in Christ, you've got it all. Now you just got to add the color and form around it. But inside of your bulletin, if you have one, raise it up in the air. Uh, you have this bulletin right here. This is a gospel presentation. This is an adaptation from Steps to Peace with God, Billy Graham's material. It's very good. We've added a, a few things in here. And I put it in your bulletin because it'll fit in your Bible. And what I would like for you to do is you take this home. You make this a part of your knowledge. You know this. You can pray for a heart to love people. You can look for opportunities. And you can live out your faith. Those are all very good things and very important things. But at some point, you're going to have to say something. What are you going to say? Let me walk you through this. I like to put it into four steps. First step is God loves you. Hallelujah. God loves you and has a wonderful plan. God loves you, but there's a simple problem called sin. That problem was solved in Christ Jesus. We got the cross for our sins, and all you have to do is say, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior, and you are saved by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. I just did that in 60 seconds. This is a little bit longer. So you'll talk about that God loves you. John 3.16 is, can we all together say, For God so loved the world, and He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. What's fun about that is some of you all say in King James, in ASB, in Ivy, in other Whosoever, whoever, it is. 
There's a pattern. <clears throat> God loves you and wants a relationship with you, but there's a problem called sin, and it's between you and God. How do we get rid of that sin? God desires that relationship with us, but that problem gets in the way, and God solved that problem in Christ Jesus. The problem called sin is universal, for we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody. Everybody has fallen short. Me, you, them, all of us have fallen short. They'll probably try to divert you there, but what about the pygmy in Indonesia? Let's talk about you first, and then we'll send you as a missionary to the pygmy in Indonesia. That usually stops the conversation right there. So whenever I get into that, they say, well, what about the person in you know, Papua New Guinea? And I say, I don't know about the person in Papua New Guinea, but maybe God is calling you to go to Papua New Guinea, and so let's get this thing with you and Jesus done first, and then we'll start training you to Papua New Guinea, because it appears to me that you love people in Papua New Guinea. And they go, Let's now talk about you. <laughs> That's called the smoke screen. Let's get past the smoke screen. And so you talk about sin, a problem called sin. For all of sin falls short of the glory of God. The Bible also say this, says that there's a, a way that seems right to men, but in the end it leads to death. How do we then get past the problem called sin? Step three, the solution is Christ Jesus. There's only one solution. And this is where you'll be called near alignment. Okay? That's okay. You'll be fine. I get called narrow. It's okay. I'm okay with that. Are you okay with that? Because we all agree that Jesus is the only way to heaven. So when you feel alone, just remember right now there's 125 of us in here, and we all agree with you. Okay? So you're not alone in what you believe. And so there's the solution is Christ Jesus. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died in our place. How do we apply that to our account? How do we apply that? Is to respond to Christ Jesus. And that is to ask him to be our Savior. By grace, through faith in Christ nothing else. You simply ask Him to be your Savior. You've got to make it personal. By grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of the of works, lest no one should boast. You have to make it yours. And oftentimes you get to that bottom part of the gospel presentation, thank you, and you get to the bottom of that, and you have to ask, do they want it? If you're in sales, probably the most important question you have in sales is for the check. You have to ask do you want to buy this? Are you interested? Have you ever made it yours? Do you want this? You have to ask, do you want this? And they might say, well, I'm not really sure. And now you're leading that different discussion. But you have to ask, how do you do this? You admit that you've sinned. You invite Christ to be your Savior. And he's yours. Permanently yours. Forever. Would you like to do that right now? Well, maybe I'll do that later. I'm not really sure. Why not right now? I'm not really sure. Sure about what? That you're a sinner or that God loves you? I'm sure of both. I've seen you. <laughs> I'm sure of both. <laughs> Ask them. And invite them. But this is the most important thing that you can grasp as a believer. You will step out in faith. You have people who will walk around your sphere of influence. Me, I have to lead Deborah to Christ every other week. That's the person who I see all the time. And so I had... But we, sometimes there are already natural relationships. Other times you have to jump start. I'm not asking you to go cold turkey knocking on a door. Anybody ever done that before? Scare you to death, haven't Yeah, I've had doors slammed in my face, and it was an interesting experience. But I knew people loved me in other places, so I don't have to have that man love me. It's okay. I don't even know who he is. So what? Walk away. This is not in high school, okay? I've got friends, all right? So we'll walk away from that. What I'm asking you to do is just people who are around you. Pray that you see them as God sees them. Look for opportunities. Listen for opportunities. Be in tune with the spiritual things that are going on around you. And when it pops up, say something. So what I have to do, it's kind of funny, some guy will come here and he's going to wash our windows. His name is Tim. I believe it is Tim. He's going to wash our windows. My job, before he leaves this building, is to find out where he is with Christ Jesus. Because how dare he come in here to wash my windows and I don't try to show the gospel. So I have to work fast. I feel a little more confrontational. But i got to work fast because I'm only going to see him just for a little bit. If the plumber comes to my house to work on something, I've got a small window to talk about his relationship with Christ Jesus. It's a very small window, and I've got to push it in there. You might have friends who are already there. You have lunch with them. You see them on a daily basis, and you know that they don't either know Jesus or they're not walking with Jesus. And so you have a time to build. If you don't have that environment, then you have to work a little faster. And so I encourage you, look for those opportunities 
And when they come up, jump in. And you'll walk out going, oh, that was scary. That was awesome. I was at uh, the Ranger game. Whenever we lost Friday night. And I was there early. And I stood at the first base <coughs> entrance point. I was there an hour, two hours early. I was going to walk back in front. And uh, I'm standing there in the sea of red and blue with Texas written all over the place. It was awesome. And uh, we're all there. We're all on the same team. And then some guy walks up. And he's in a black hat, white shirt with black stripes. And it says socks, white socks on his hat. That's who we're playing. And uh, looking at him, thinking, the audacity of you to come here and be amongst us. How do you even breathe? I don't know. <laughs> and then the security guard is out. And he got his little Garrett wands, and he's singling out the white sock fan. That's how I perceive it. And there's another sock fan over here. If you look at him, and they're singled out because they're not in red and they're not in blue. And I'm just looking at him going, and then there's a Yankee fan. Again, we all agreed to throw rocks at him. And so we're all standing there. And I thought, how brave. How many of you would be comfortable doing that? To go to your, just, just try it. Go to a, a Ranger game and wear the opposing team's uniform and stand there and not care. Could you go as a Ranger fan to the Angel Stadium in Warrior, Texas? Sure. You know, they'll do that every now and then when we're traveling. We're we, they are traveling, and they'll find Ranger fans. And I'm thinking, there's 47,000 people out there, and there are two Ranger fans. How comfortable would you be? Now spiritualize that. There are 47,000 people who don't like Jesus. Are you going to wear your Jesus shirt? And that's what I'm asking you to do. Say something. You might be in The oil field is, is rough. I get it. It's rough out there. I've heard stories. Are you willing to say something about Jesus out there? That's rough. But that's what God's called us to do. And he's going to place you in that environment to do that very thing. Because those guys out there, whether on the oil patch or at the bank or at the hospital or in the office or at the retirement center, wherever you might find yourself, they do this. And it is our responsibility to say something. So this is what I want you to do. Don't say a word this week. Nobody. Got it? If you get the urge to tell somebody about Jesus, stop. Stop. But you're free. Don't, you don't have to say anything. I want you to pray this week that God gives you a heart for the guy next door. In that cubicle, in that office, on that ship, wherever it might be, I want you to start praying, Lord, help me to see that person. When you go to that restaurant, don't see a waitress. That's her job. That's not who she is. See a person. She's a waitress. That's not who she is. That's what she does. Inside of that uniform is a real-life person as real as your daughter or your best friend or your aunt or whoever. It's a real-life person. You just start seeing people, not products that they bring. I want you to pray for that. Lord, help me to see people. Help me to have a divine perspective of people. Then the following week, we'll do this. I want you then to look for those opportunities. See people in the week two. Look for the opportunity. Now, Lord, I need to see, now that I see people, I'm going to look for opportunities. Show me not just people. Show me opportunities. And then week three, after we're doing this, then we'll say something. Now, Lord, give me the ability, the courage, whatever it is, Say something. What I like to say when I bump into the guy who's going to wash the windows, <coughs> fix the plumbing, the air conditioning, I don't like to say, so what church do you go to? Is that totally diverse the subject? I, I asked him, so tell me what you know about Jesus. What do you know about Jesus? And they'll look back and go, well, uh, I don't know. They might say that. They might say, well, I went to church when I was little. Okay, what do they teach you about Jesus? Make Jesus the central part of everything. Tell me what you know about Jesus. And just keep drilling. I just keep drilling. Well, he was a good man. Okay, well, what did he do as a good man? Well, he healed me. Right? What else did he do? I ask him. And I just keep drilling to find out what they know about Jesus. If they come out and say, well, he died on the cross for my sins, I accept him as my Savior. Wonderful. Now I invite them to church. Because church is a sanctification issue. It is not a salvation issue. So then I invite them. Church. Well, hey, what, what church do you go to? Well, I really haven't found a good one. 
You're in one, pal. You need to come here. I won't pay you next time. But you need to come here and be part of this church. You'll love it. Or you'll say, come with me in my church. You'll love it there. Come with me. They already know Jesus. Salvation is taken care of. Now they need church. But this week, say nothing. Pray that God gives you a heart for the people around you in your sphere of influence. Who are they? Can you think of names? Who are they? That you see all the time. Yet you have no idea of their eternal destination. Hell is as real as heaven. Think about it. You have no idea. Don't you want to find that out? Find that out. But this week, pray. Lord, give me a heart to love these people. And so when I do share the gospel, it's from love, not from duty. The following week, you look for an opportunity. The week after that, 